We start the uh, afternoon session. I hope everybody is well fed. Don't fall asleep uh, uh, after your lunch. Uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce uh, Andrea Califano, who is uh, one of the co-organizers of uh, this conference and also a co-founder with me very many years ago of the Dream, uh, the Dream Project. Andrea is the director of the Columbia University Department of Systems Biology and uh, also leads the Genome Center um, the, and is the Associate Director of Bioinformatics at Columbia University Irving Cancer Research Center. He's also a, a, a member of the Board of Scientific Advisors at NCI. And so those of you who know Andrea um, know that he has been a leading uh, researcher in the area of network biology as applied to cancer research. And I think that he, better than anybody uh, in the field, has shown how to take you know, squeeze knowledge out of this, um, this, these hairballs and really uh, make uh, clinically relevant predictions. So with this, Andrea. It is an absolute dream to be presenting to this audience, I have to say, after only about 10 years of uh, seeing this grow into such an amazing uh, 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 operation. I think this sort of with Gustavo and Steve uh, taking it to the next level. Um, thank you so much for inviting me and for listening to uh, what I am going to tell you. Um, so I wanted to contrast what has been the light motif paradigm for studying genomics. And we now do things in high throughput fashion, but still, you know, we do things very much one gene at a time. Um, and that idea is that we should try to figure out whether there are whether there, are, this is not working. whether there are essentially relationship, associative relationship between the presence of a particular mutation or variant in a gene and in fact a particular phenotypic outcome, be it uh, sort of disease initiation or uh, 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 sensitivity to a particular treatment. Um, and this has been really successful in identifying certain really interesting relationship. For instance, we know that uh, mutation, uh, mutations in the, in the superoxide dismutase gene um, have 100% penetrance in uh, ALS. Um, yet, even though this was identified um, over 20 years ago, there is still no therapy for ALS. So we should also be careful about the fact that not always knowing the genetic association, even when it's a completely Mendelian uh, penetrant, uh, fully penetrant variant is going to inform uh, on the mechanism or the, th or the therapeutic approach. In fact, we don't even know how SOD1 mechanistically induces ALS. Uh, in other areas, like for instance in BCR ABL fusion, obviously, we all know that this has been transformational in CML. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit of, a, of an orphan, and uh, it was essentially what you would call a low hanging fruit. And so, imatinib and the entire class of uh, sort of uh, ABL kit kinase inhibitors has become both the poster child and also the elusive dream of, uh, um, of, of personalized medicine. In fact, we know that as you start going down to less penetrant events, like for instance, HER2 in breast cancer, we know that about 70% of the patient with HER2 amplification respond initially to uh, uh, trastuzumab uh, or Herceptin, and, but about 70% of those who respond will eventually relapse with trastuzumab independent uh, or resistant disease. And in other areas where we're starting to look at uh, some of the discoveries that have been heralded a major, major accomplishments in, in personalized therapy, uh, like, for instance, uh, the use of vemurafenib as a highly, uh, highly potent, high-affinity uh, BRAF inhibitors. Um, really, we know that uh, although we have significant response initially, there is really no uh, uh, prolongation of, you know, in ter terms of overall life expectancy. Um, and what you do increase is the disease-free uh, uh, progression. So, so this, uh, this entire, uh, so in cancer at least, this entire uh, uh, mechanism of, of discovery followed by action is based on this uh, sort of paradigm called the actionable mutation paradigm, which has also uh, been called oncogene addiction. Um, and I wanted to point out to some of the shortcoming and limitation of such an approach. The first one is that, you know, and I hate this metaphor, but it's a huge haystack. And as we start looking at very complex uh, traits where the polygeny can have a lot of different uh, potential variants associated with a particular outcome. Uh, this is a pretty difficult problem to solve. But I think the more importantly, the thing that I'd like to point out is that even if you solve this problem, for instance, identify SOD1 in ALS, there's still 
the associative approach provides no mechanistic clues. We, you can't go to the lab with an experiment and say, oh, I understand why that association is there. Um, this requires extremely large samples, and very often, because of these large sample size, uh, geneticists have come up with very helpful, very useful heuristics, but these heuristics can actually hide or mask some of the important associations. Uh, for instance, focality, recurrence, uh, you know, looking at single head in, within amplicons, et cetera. But I think that probably the key uh, issue that I would like to point out is that it is almost impossible. In fact, I don't know, maybe other people in the audience know, but I don't know of a single case where straight out of associated discovery, you could identify a synergistic or, 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 or epistatic interaction simply because we don't have enough power, the, the size of the population that is necessary to identify this situation where two genes have no effect individually, but they have a very strong effect in, in combination. The size of that population is, is not currently achievable. Um, Another big problem is that uh, where are the, all these mutations? So this is cancer, this is breast cancer, in fact, and you can see that the top gene, most mutated gene, is PI3 kinase, and it's about 26% of the patient have uh, activated mutations. Um, but w we know that tumors are really not a single hit disease, and so there probably has to be somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, different hits uh, that we should find. But if you look at all the patients in breast cancer, uh, yeah, there are a few patients that are hypermutated and have multiple hits, but the vast majority of the patients have either one or two hits, or in fact, no hits that we can recognize, okay? And so it is a little bit of a challenge to try and, and relate everything to genetics because I think what we'll discover is that more and more cancer is driven by really what we call uh, private events um, that may be individual gene fusion event, individual mutation of certain gene, individual very complex predisposition patterns that then associate with genetics or with potentially epigenetic control. And so what we came up is, uh, with is, is a little bit of a different way of thinking about the problem. So instead of thinking of the cell as sort of a mechanism that is disrupted by individual genetic events, we think of the cell as an integrator of very diverse signals, including endogenous germline variant predisposition signal, somatic mutation, epigenetic alteration, drug perturbation, 3D contact signal, et cetera. And we actually use the cell as a mechanism that can determine what is the particular context in which it's living, both endogenous and exogenous, by interrogating these regulatory pathways uh, or regulatory networks that determine cell behavior. The, the aha moment that this was actually possible came uh, several years ago when, in collaboration with Ricardo La Favara, we discovered that this gene, actually this complex, NF-kappa-B, which is really uh, have different type of, of uh, uh, subunits that implement it, um, is actually aberrantly regulated in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma as a result of many different mutations in the BCR pathway, each one of them with a very small penetrance, and, and in fact, not just small penetrance, but small frequency, um, and it, the, the interesting thing was that any of the cells that had this mutation, for instance, in MID88, in uh, A20, CARD11, et cetera, were actually addicted to the activity of NF-kappa-B. And so even though NF-kappa-B itself was not mutated, and none of the subunits were mutated, these cells were very exquisitely sensitive to inhibition of NF-kappa-B, while the cells that didn't have this mutation had no addiction at all. And we call this non-oncogene dependency. I think Steve Elledge has used a very similar uh, 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 name, and I think also with uh, uh, Stuart Schreiber uh, and others, we now use this, this approach routinely. So the idea is, can we identify systematically this kind of non-oncogene dependencies that have profound impact on cancer survival and cancer viability as a function of all the genetic alterations that are upstream? And Obviously, to do that, you need very, very accurate models uh, of the sort of regulation of a cell. But if you do have these models, some of the advantages that this model-based approach offers are that, first of all, they, it makes the haystack very, very small because now the network collapses dramatically in the number of genes and hypotheses that you can actually look at. And in fact, we now routinely run these type of methods on just single patients and, in fact, single cells. And I'll show you the results. Um, the key advantage of such an approach is that it provides direct mechanistic clues. If we know that a particular gene is, is nominated by the methods, we also know why, and we can go and design an experiment that will test that specific mechanism in vitro and then in vivo. 
Um, as I said, it works also in single samples. It, co it completely eliminates heuristics because now the number of genes that you look at are so small that you don't need heuristics. Uh, and it's really optimally suited to elucidate synergistic and epistatic interaction. In fact, I would say that virtually everywhere we've looked, we almost always find synergistic or epistatic interactions. So um, what have we learned uh, by exploring quite a number of these uh, models, um, about 20 of them, in fact? Uh, so these are publications where we have essentially shown that in cancer, but not just in cancer, also in other diseases, for instance, we recently published for stem cell pluripotency and for uh, 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 alcohol uh, addiction and, and several other diseases that are not cancer-related, that you can identify a very small number of regulators that actually essentially implement downstream programs that represent the hallmark of the particular disease you have in mind. So this would be in cancer, would be the classical Anhan and uh, uh, um, Weinberger uh, uh, cancer hallmarks, for example, refloration, migration, et cetera. And so what you can do is you can start from these differential expression patterns and then traverse back the regulatory network until you find the genes that regulate these programs rather than the genes that are differentially expressed or mutated in the programs, okay? But the other even more interesting thing is that once you have these small, regulator, these small number of regulators, uh, we call them master regulators, but they probably should be better called master integrators, is that you can traverse the, pattern, the, the pathways upstream of them to find all the different mutation, which will be implemented literally in different ways in every different patient, okay? And so these are papers where we have essentially looked at this part of the network, but very recently, about two weeks ago, we published a paper in Cell where we showed that you can now traverse the networks upstream of glioma, breast cancer, and even Alzheimer's, so for, the, uh, for looking not just the somatic variants, but also germline variants, and discover essentially the full complement of uh, mutation and uh, a predisposition variants that determine the state of the disease. So how does that work? Um, so this is the, essentially, if you want, a, a progression uh, of multiple algorithms. We use an, al an algorithm called Arachne to infer the transcriptional targets of every possible regulator in the cell, both transcription factor and signaling proteins. So we have now relationships that indicate positive regulation and repression. And what we're looking for are the candidate regulators to an algorithm called Marina that essentially are positively uh, regulate all the genes that are overexpressed and repress all the genes that are underexpressed in a particular phenotype. Okay? Once we have identified these, uh, these nodes, um, we can use another algorithm called MINDI that allows us to traverse uh, all the upstream networks and find any upstream modulator that modulates the activity of these proteins. And then we can use uh, what we call AQTL type of approaches to determine whether any of these genes contain aberrant uh, mutations or, or variants. And, um, and this sounds complicated, but it's actually extremely easy to do. We now have a SWIFT uh, uh, document that allows you to just rerun the entire analysis that is provided with the, uh, with the manuscript. And uh, we've now run this analysis on every single uh, cancer patient in TCGA, and in fact, in several other non-TCGA related uh, uh, data sets. So as I said, uh, the, the, type, the type of analysis that I've shown requires that you really construct regulatory models that are very accurate. And one of the things that we've learned is that these have to be really reconstructed de novo in every different tumor context, because there's no two tumor contexts that really have the same complement of interaction. So we've used uh, algorithms like Arachne to reconstruct transcriptional footprint of any regulators. Mindy and Preppy. Preppy is an algorithm to identify protein-protein interaction based on structural data. Uh, and Mindy uses something called the conditional mutual information to identify upstream modulators to discover pathways in signal transduction space. Um, another two algorithms called Cupid and Hermes. Uh, Cupid just uh, appeared in uh, uh, genome research, and uh, uh, Hermes was published in Cell a few uh, a couple of years back that essentially dissect all the, all the mic, uh, microRNA uh, targets and microRNA-mediated interactions. And then a bunch of algorithms that I'll talk about today that essentially allow you to explore these regulatory models to discover relevant genes and mechanisms. And we've now assembled quite a, a remarkable, I think, collection of uh, models that cover virtually every known tumors, including some, uh, like for some neuroendocrine tumors where we have really assembled the data ourselves, being a pretty gargantuan effort. Uh, with the help of the Falconwood Foundation. I'll show you data uh, at the end for that. But also in neurodegenerative and neurobehavioral diseases in stem cell um, and, and development. 
So, um, so how do we use these interactomes? Essentially, the paradigm is extremely simple. We start from a particular uh, transition that we're interested in. Could be a transition between normal to uh, neoplastic tissue or from primary tissue, uh, primary tumor tissue to metastatic disease. Um, and we generate a signature, which could be a gene expression signature, microRNA signature, phosphoproteomic signature, whatever you want. And then we ask the question, given this model, the model of the network, and given this signature, what are the genes that are responsible for having implemented that signature? And we feel that these genes, these regulators, are in fact, because constitute the vulnerability, the, the, the addiction points of these tumors. Uh, but this methodology can be equally used, and I'll show you really, I think, hopefully very interesting result, to probe signature that are induced by small molecule perturbation, because if you have an entire, say, FDA-approved library, you can take the library and perturb every one, uh, every compound, a particular set of cell lines. Uh, for instance, has been done by, by the Lynx Consortium, but we also do uh, in, in, on, our, on our own lab, generate signature, and then use exactly the same algorithm with exactly the same network to ask, what are the nodes that are the effectors of the drug activity? And by simply matching the effectors of drug activity to with the proteins that you want to shut down in cancer, as I'll show you, you can predict very effectively uh, which compounds will be best suited to uh, ab abrogate viability of particular tumors. And then we can do uh, a third type of uh, assays, which is chemosensitivity or drug sensitivity-based assay. We can ask if I have a resistance and a sensitive cell then can I identify a master regulator of resistance that when abrogated, rescue sensitivity to uh, the, the compound? And this, for instance, was published recently in Cancer Cell with Adolfo Ferrando, where we showed that uh, the glucocorticoid receptor um, is actually uh, uh, modulated by AKT1. And so if you have hyperactivity of AKT1, uh, you completely abrogate activity of glucocorticoid receptors, in, uh, glucocorticoids in TLL. So how do we traverse back the network? This is a, an algorithm that has been developed at different stages, first by Celine Lefebvre in the lab, and then most recently by Mariano Alvarez. And the idea is very simple. Uh, imagine that you have a regulators, and in red, I'm representing the positively regulated targets. In blue, I represent the repressed targets. And in black, I represent the targets that I really don't know whether they're activated or repressed. It's just you know, a mess, but we know that there is a relationship. And what we're trying to find is whether the red ones are enriched in genes that are overexpressed, the blue one in genes that are underexpressed, and the black one in genes that are simply differentially expressed by absolute value. And so we do a three-tail uh, analysis using a variant of the, uh, of the GSEA algorithm. And now this allows us to identify uh, proteins that are positive regulator of the signature, negative regulator of the signature, so they have their positive targets that are repressed, uh, are, sorry, underexpressed, uh, or simply have not any effect on the signature. Uh, like this third case. And one thing that is very important, we have to be really careful because sometimes two regulators may actually overlap a lot in terms of their regulons. And so because this one is a real master regulator of the, of the, of the signature, this one may now appear to be a master regulator because it's also enriched. And what we do is we can now basically remove the shared area and ask whether the significance of the remaining targets is now decreased and that eliminates um, a lot of false positive, but it's also very important because if the area where both genes co-regulate the targets is actually most enriched, that's a dead giveaway for synergy. And in fact, every single time we found one of these events, we have essentially experimentally validated a synergistic interaction. So let me show you something that, you know, I fell off the chair when I saw this. These are 85 single cells extracted from a proneural glioma. Um, and this is the expression of the cells this, you can see it's very noisy. There's two million reads per cell. Um, but you can see even from this very simple, um, very noisy graph that these are mesenchymal genes and these are proneural genes. And so you can see that within this population, there are mesenchymal cells and proneural cells, even though we thought that the, that the tumor was an actual proneural tumor. And this has been reported also at the Broad Institute. But what was very interesting is that when we do master regulator analysis on the signature, you get a spectacularly more clear, you know, clearer picture because the way this mass regular analysis works is that it integrates the signal of hundreds of genes that are in the regulon of a particular regulator. So the noise that comes from the error that you can make in, in measuring single cell uh, expression is completely averaged out. And this is what, what is really remarkable here is that these are all uh, uh, mesenchymal single cells, and these are proneural single cells. These genes that we identify in the top 20, completely unbiased analysis of the master regulator, are the genes that we had reported in a Nature paper 
on mesenchymal glioma. And these genes are the gene that were reported as master regulator of the pronural glioma from population. So basically, a single tumor recapitulates the complexity of an entire population, and you can assess that on a single cell level with really high, very incredible you know, uh, quality of the result. So I really, I mean, honestly, I really didn't think that was going to work. And certainly, I thought that maybe we would find some of this gene enriched, you know, no, 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 you know and, and, and a lot of noise. But the fact that you can actually detect them from single cells so effectively was remarkable. Um, so we can, as I said, we can use this with drug signatures. Uh, this is very important because it allows us to prioritize compounds for treating patients. And so, for instance, uh, the idea is that if you use an estrogen inhibitor, um, estrogen receptor inhibitor, the estrogen receptor protein will actually not change in expression at all because these drugs work post-translationally. They don't change the expression of the target protein. But the targets of the estrogen receptor will be dramatically inactivated in terms of expression. And so you can use these analyses not only to predict that these, these inhibitors abrogate activity of the estrogen receptor, but even to show that they do so in dose-dependent manner. So the higher dose decreases more the activity of the, receptor, of, of the, of the, of the inhibitor. Uh, and this works extremely well even for post-translational targets. So this is uh, mTOR and FKBP1 with uh, serolimus. And uh, you can see that in terms of expression, actually these two proteins go up a little bit. But in, in terms of activity, they're dramatically reduced following administration of the compound. So we tested this in an unbiased fashion. So we said, let's see if we can find some MYC inhibitors in the current repertoire of uh, uh, FDA-approved drugs that were tested in the connectivity map. And so we used the MYC Regulon, and we asked whether that was highly down-regulated down in terms of activity, or inverted in terms of activity, uh, as, a, as a result of perturbation with all the different, whatever, 2,600 compounds in CMAP. And these are the top 20 that we then tested using a turtle cifrase assay for specific uh, MYC uh, activity. And what you're seeing here is that basically about nine of the, of the top, whatever, 20 or so, um, had very significant uh, activity in terms of repressing mix. So this is the highest concentration. This is the lowest concentration. And it was completely dose dependent. Um, and remember, these uh, uh, luciferase reported are very leaky. And so typically, somewhere around 0.4 is what you get for, uh, you know, if you silence mix. Great. So let's see how we can start building some complete stories out of this type of uh, methodological approaches. So one question that we wanted to ask is in prostate cancer, and these results have been published in, in Cancer Cell about uh, a year ago, um, but I'll show also some data that is not published, uh, was the idea that maybe we can use uh, both, you know, sort of a cross-species approach to study both the mouse as a model and human as a model, and to see whether the intersection of that has real value in terms of uh, elucidating the driver of the disease. And so we decided to essentially study regulatory models of, of human prostate cancer, a regulatory model for mouse prostate cancer, and to ask the same question using murine or human signature and see whether we would get the same answer. Okay? And then use different drugs, both in the human and in the mouse, and see whether we get the same answer. For the human, we could actually get a beautiful data set of memorial Sloan Kettering, which actually highly enriched in metastatic tumors. Um, but for the mouse, nobody's crazy enough to actually create a cohort of mice that have prostate cancer. So we had to do a little bit different experiment, not for the faint of heart. So we basically collected 13 different transgenic mouse models from the community. This was a huge community effort driven by Corey Abadishan that recapitulated the entire progression of prostate cancer from normal epithelium, normal prostate epithelium, to metastatic disease. Uh, and you can see the scatter in terms of the uh, gene expression uh, variability in these models. And then each one of these models was treated in vivo with uh, one of 14 different compounds, I mean, with all of them. So we had 13 times 14 matrix uh, of, of, of in vivo treatment. And you can see, again, a great reproducibility in terms of the same compound being repeated twice, but great spread overall in terms of the effect of the individual compounds. And then we interrogated a human interactome with a human signature of malignant prostate cancer, basically high grison score, and very quick biochemical recurrence. And we interrogated a mouse model with five different signatures. I'm just showing one, but all of five gave exactly the same result. Um, for instance, this, this one is a signature where you compare the KRAS mutant uh, versus the background of just NCAX 3.1 MP10 homozygous deletion. And lo and behold, what we found is that seven master regulators were actually completely conserved between human and mouse. Uh, this was about seven out of 20, top 20. 
Not only that, but actually if you looked at all possible combinations of the seven, there was only one pair that was predicted by the computer to be highly synergistic. What do we mean by that? We mean that the targets that are co-regulated by both FOXM1 and CMPF are spectacularly more enriched in this malignant signature than the targets regulated by either one of the two proteins independently. Okay? And exactly what I showed you before. The intersection of the regulant, more, more enriched than the individual regulant. And so, I just want to make sure you understand. So we put the model in the computer with data. The computer said, these are two genes. These two genes are synergistic. So then we went to the lab with Corey, and we just tested those two genes. And as you can see here, when you silent FOXN1, as reported by many labs, there's a little bit of a uh, slowdown in, in growth, but these tumors keep growing. They will grow exponentially, and they will kill the animal. Uh, when you silence CMPF, there's even less of an effect. When you silence both of them, this tumor completely tank. And in fact, this is not really fair because after 25 days, almost certainly you have selected some clones that are not really silencing one or the other two genes, and so the tumors start re-expressing. So what we did is an in vivo competition assay, and this is the work of Alvaro Itis in uh, Corey's lab, where we injected red cells that were silenced only for FOXM1, green cells silenced only from CMPF, and yellow cells that had both of the vectors. And you can see that essentially after 25 days, the yellow compartment was completely gone. The tumor is completely dominated by the, re the green and the red. More importantly, and I think this is really critical, so this shows that these genes are necessary for maintaining the tumor viability. But are they sufficient to induce it? So these are, this is data from almost 900 patients that were followed for about 20 years. Um, and these are TMAs that were collected at Memorial Sloan Kettering. What you're seeing here, which I think is, is truly remarkable, is, is that the blue curve indicates the double negative in immunostostaining for FOXM1 and CMPF. The red curve indicates the double positive for CMPF. And essentially, there's nobody that dies with the double negative and the double positive recapitulate virtually the full burden of the disease. You cannot have aggressive prostate cancer without coactivating these two proteins. Okay? And this is not our prediction. This is basically the data you see. You cannot, it almost cannot have metastatic progression without both proteins. And I want to point out that these green and yellow are the single gene. And as you can see, they're not even statistically significant. I mean, if you have out of 900 uh, uh, patients, you have a p-value of 0.01, you better pack and go home. Um, the p-value for the two genes is 10 to the minus 9. And by the way, these are patients that were, uh, whose tissue was collected at diagnosis, and therefore you can see there is a dramatic change in, the, uh, in, in when the curve starts to go down. These patients don't start to go down until much later, and even though very few of them die, they probably at that time acquire the aberrant activity of the other gene. All right, so now, why is it so damn complicated to find the same thing using genetics? Why can't we find a genetic and a mutation that actually tells us exactly the same thing. Because when we apply this algorithm called DIGIT to study what are the genes that actually induce a barren activity of CMPF FOXM1, it's not one gene. It's an entire pattern of gene, and it doesn't really matter. These are, these are not gene in amplicons. Uh, this is an amplicon, and this is, not, this is what? An amplicon, this is a deleticon, I guess you would call it. Um, and so there are some things that are on the same chromosome, but most of these genes have nothing to do with each other. Many of these in the black are just mutations. These are amplification in red and deletion in blue. You can see the pattern of gene that could segregate with aberrant activity of FOXM1. This is predicted activity, not expression, of FOXM1 and CMPF. Not only are different, so you get different genes here and here, although some of them are the same, uh, but they're also extremely complicated. So try and get a pattern out of this that is predictive. It's hard. All right, so this, is this a sort of a freak of nature? We were lucky in, in studying prostate cancer, or is this uh, more effective, uh, as the effect broadly across other diseases? So this is actually the very first study that we did, which was in uh, mesenchymal glioma, where we found essentially master regulators called CP beta, CP delta, and STAT3. And actually, you can see here that silencing either STAT3 or CP beta does almost nothing. This glioma remain extremely aggressive. And these are uh, uh, orthotopic transplants in the brain of the mouse. Uh, but if you actually science both of them, only one out of 12 animals had a tumor. And that tumor was not a glioma because you can see there's no cells that are migrating in a nearby environment. And we were then able to, um, 
I think, well, I'm missing something here. But this is, this is published in the, the study two weeks ago uh, that we were able to go upstream of these and identify a mutation in a ubiquitin ligase adapter protein called Kalechil 9 that is in 60% of the mesenchymal subtype. So you may ask, why wasn't it found by GWAS? Because that protein is right next P16, which is the most deleted gene in glioma. And people simply didn't look next to it, which is like within 19 KB of it, there's another protein, and if you actually delete P16 without deleting that protein, you get the best possible prognosis. You co-delete that protein, you get the absolute worst prognosis, okay? And you, this essentially came out just from the analysis of the network, because without the network, we would have never even looked at that, at that ligase. Um, and we found also amplification of CV delta in about 30% of the patient. Why weren't those look at? Well, because there is a single probe in the, AFI, in the Agilent array on CV delta, and this is such a focal event that you know, that, that one was discarded because of a single probe. In the, af in the affymetrics set, there was one probe to the left, one probe to the right, and they were diluting the signal. And so you can't see the signal. But if you actually go there and look, there's a very, very strong signal in about 30%, and we, which were validated by sequencing, of course. All right, this is a similar study that we did in uh, 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 TALL. This is uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where, as I said, the first line of defense is glucocorticoid treatment. About 70% of the patient respond and are treated forever. Okay, it's remarkable. This gene is never mutated, of course, so it's another well-established non-oncogene addiction. But about 30% of the patient actually do not respond, relapse, and relapse with glucocorticoid-resistant uh, disease. So we studied, basically, the signature of the resistance versus sensitive patient before they were treated, and the algorithm said nine genes, three of them were validated, one of them was AKT1, and Adolfo Ferrando then showed that AKT1 actually phosphorylates the glucocorticoid receptor at serine 134 and prevents its translocation to the nucleus. So essentially, completely mechanistically, you're now abrogating a vital function that is necessary for the glucocorticoid to function. And you can see here that in mice that were now treated with an inhibitor of AKT, this is a, a Merck inhibitor called MK2206, you completely rescue uh, glucocorticoid sensitivity uh, and, and essentially treat the animal. And finally, let me show you what I think is essentially the first uh, clinical study. This is a clinical trial that opened up and now already uh, enrolled one patient. Uh, and it's very anecdotic, but the story goes that she's gone home and uh, the pain that she had from this untreatable uh, disease, this is breast cancer, has completely disappeared within one week. Um, and the idea was that with Jose Silva, we discovered that the master regulator of resistance to trastuzumab in RB2 positive patient was STAT3. And it turned out that STAT3 actually gets activated by a loop that starts with secretion of IL-6 and essentially outside of the cell activation of the IL-6 receptor and of the downstream jack stat cascade. So that once you've triggered uh, in tumor initiation with uh, aberrant levels over B2, this loop keeps going, and even if you shut this down, you will select cells that have very strong effect through this loop. But if you use another inhibitor called ruxolinib, which is a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, you abrogate this mechanism, and now STAT3 is very strongly dephosphorylated, and these tumors, as you can see, there's a dramatic reduction in tumor mass, which is really synergistic um, with respect to use of trastuzumab alone. So, <coughs> Can we apply this in, to every single tumor? So we did, decided to look at, like Josh Stewart was talking before, uh, really sort of a pan-cancer approach. And I think one of the problem in cancer studies is that we have been for a long time driven by this notion of cancer subtypes. What is a subtype? Well, a subtype is simply a collection of patients that have some mechanism in common, most of them associated actually with development, for instance, luminal versus basal epithelium. But they're not necessarily all of the mechanisms in common. And so within a subtype, there is tremendous heterogeneity. For instance, not all uh, hormone-positive breast cancer respond to, to, to tamoxifen. Not all uh, uh, prostate cancer that have androgen receptor activity respond to uh, uh, chemical castration. So what we decided to do is that can we go patient by patient across all whatever the 6,700 6, patients in TCGA and completely ignore the previous classification, and just ask, what are the master regulators of the patient? So we have the version of the Viper algorithm that allows us now to do a single cell or single patient signature analysis, we were able to do that. And essentially what we found is that if we use only 25 master regulators, and there's an actual an, an information theoretic reason why this number is, is 25, we can actually stratify the entire TCGA on a patient-by-patient -patient basis 
And you can see here that, for instance, all the basal tumors, these are in bladder cancer and breast cancer, go together. All the luminal tumors go together. This is again in breast cancer and, and bladder cancer. All the luminal B are highly co-segregating together compared to the luminal A. And so you get, you get really, really very strong effect just based on the dependencies of these tumors. Okay? And then we went and tested this. And what you're seeing here is, for instance, in breast cancer, if you take the top 25 master regulators, almost all of them, when you silence, have very sp specific activity in luminal cells which are the blue ones. And so this is growth in a targeted pool assay that Arch and I did. And Arch and I will present this data, I think, either tomorrow or the day after. Um, and you can see that luminal tumors essentially die when you silence these very well-established uh, master regulators that were discovered de novo from, from our analysis. But more importantly, that when you do the same thing with basal tumors, you have exactly the opposite effect. All the basal cells die, and the luminal cells are much less affected. Okay? And so, I think that what we're proposing is a restratification of tumors, not based on the genes that make them similar, but based on the genes that they depend on. Okay? And then you can go upstream of those and find, of course, the important mutations. So let me finish the, the talk by giving you a little bit of, a, of, of, of how we're using now this for creating data that I think will be instrumental for some of the next dream challenges, and in fact, to actually treat patients on an individual basis. So you know that the current paradigm for personalized medicine is almost universally predicated on this notion that of oncogene addiction. You find a mutation in an oncogene and you use a small molecule inhibitor of that oncogene. BRF mutation, lemurafenib, EGFR mutation, erlotinib, et cetera. The problem is that, first of all, only about 25% at most of patients will actually have a potentially actionable mutation. And in fact, most of them will actually not respond to the inhibitor. So what do we do for the remaining 75%? Okay, this, as I said. And also, there's another even bigger problem, which is that if you look, this is data from the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia that was put together by Stuart Schreiber. And you can see here that when you look at their erlotinib sensitivity, there are cell lines that are extremely sensitive to erlotinib. Some of them have mutation in EGFR. It's a lot of white here. It's a lot of cells that are spectacularly sensitive to erlotinib, but they have no mutation in EGFR. Why? Can we predict that? And in some cases, this is a gamma secretase inhibitor. There was not a single mutation that we could find that had any association with its activity in the cell. Not one. So we looked at every single. These are cells that are all completely uh, profiled. All right. So the idea that we have, uh, it's a very simple one. It says, since we can find for every tumor, we've done it for about 6,000 tumors in TCJ. For every tumor, we can find a set of master regulators that we then validate as addiction point, either single point essential gene for the tumor or synergistic dependencies, then why don't we drag those? Why don't we drag these, two, these master regulators? And we can drag them either individually or in combination. And so how do we do that? Uh, well, we do it by essentially using the same algorithm that we used to discover the master regulator. We now can use it to prioritize the drug. So let's say that I have a patient that has progressed from primary to metastatic disease. This is the signature. I interrogate it against the model, and these are the master regulators of that patient. These are activated master regulators. These are repressed master regulators. We know, because we've now done it, as I showed you also result, that at a minimum, about 20% of these red genes will be essential for the tumors, and almost 100% of the one that we predict, a synergistic one, will be essential for the tumor when inhibited. So I don't care which one are the key genes, if I have a drug that shuts down this entire signature, it will kill the tumor. At least that's our prediction. And so what we need to do is to now essentially profile a large number of drugs, obtain signature of the drug activity in a cell that is a reporter for the particular tumor type. We don't care about the phenotype because we know that in vitro you'll get a completely different phenotype, but we care about the mechanism of action because that is very conserved between in vitro and in vivo. So if a drug is a SARC inhibitor in vitro, it will be a SARC inhibitor in vivo. Right? And so what we do is we get the signature, we interrogate it, and we try to find drugs that abrogate the activity of these regulators and activate these regulators. If we find a drug, great. If we don't find one, we can now look for a pair. We can find pairs, and this is actually a manuscript that is in a dream manuscript that is impressed uh, in uh, Nature Biotechnology, where we show that if you actually find a pair of drugs where one drug shuts down one portion of the signature and the other drug shuts down the other portion of the signature, then they tend to synergize very effectively. 
So this is a, uh, an experiment that we've done with uh, the Falconwood Foundation to study a very rare tumor. Uh, this is the tumor that kills Steve Jobs, called neuroendocrine tumors. They come from every organ in, in our body. Um, and we basically collected about 1,000 uh, uh, fresh frozen biopsy from 16 different organizations around the world. And you can see the tremendous variability here. Um, and basically what you're seeing is that we were, used, we were able to use this data to build a regulatory model. And this regulatory model by Arachne and, and Mindy uh, identified about a little more than half a million uh, interactions. These are the master regulator of one patient. This is a patient with a rectal neuroendocrine tumors. And you can see this, again, this pattern of all the positively regulated targets of these regulators are overexpressed, all the repressed targets are underexpressed, and this basically tells you what you should shut down with the drug. And we then looked at a cell line that could be used to test whether the drug would work, and we found one cell line that essentially has the same master regulators as the patient, uh, the positive ones, so almost 75% overlap between the master regulators of the cell line and those the top 25 of the patients. With Stuart Schreiber, we screened a large collection of drugs to identify about 100 that had the uh, most specificity to neuroendocrine cells. And then each one of those drugs was screened uh, and we got RNA-seq after perturbing cells, uh, neuroendocrine cells with the drug. And we basically show here whether they repress or activate the master regulator signature. So the drug that we want are the ones that repress it. This drug will do very poorly, in our opinion, uh, by our predictions in, in, in vivo. But these are the top eight drugs that we screened. And now we've screened 30 of them. I mean, obviously, the full 100, we have the data from 30 of them. And actually, the same result hold exactly. So this is really remarkable. The first drug is actually an mTOR1, mTOR2. Just two minutes is the last one. Um, an mTOR1, mTOR2 inhibitor. We didn't even test it because this is a drug that is now in clinical trials for neuroendocrine tumors. So we already know that it works well in the preclinical models. This is a HDAC1 class one uh, inhibitor. Uh, and very interestingly, another HDAC class one inhibitor was doing exactly the opposite. So we tested both of them. This one was predicted to kill the tumor. This one was predicted not to do anything. This one is Tivantinib, which is CMAT inhibitor that had been reported by others to be potentially relevant in these kind of tumors. And so we went to Champions and we tested all three of these. And what you're seeing is that the one that was predicted by master regular analysis to kill the tumor completely put the animal in, 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 in regression. Um, the tumor is shrinking and uh, going away. The other, exactly the same molecule, but no, not the same molecule, but the same class of inhibitor that was predicted not to do anything, didn't do anything. This is the other HDAC1 class inhibitor. And Sivantinib also didn't do anything. And so basically now we have expanded this analysis greatly. And I, didn't have time, actually, uh, we just went through scientific advisory board meeting um, uh, to show these results, and so I didn't have enough time to put them here. Uh, so this is now opened up as a uh, large study at Columbia. Uh, we actually have multiple studies that have opened, one for breast cancer patients that are treated with neoadjuvant therapy and then are found to have a uh, large tumor mass residual. Uh, and then the other one is these 260 patients, in nine rare or untreatable malignancies that are essentially uh, consented and enrolled in the study. They're master regulator identified. They're matched to the drugs based on screening of these compounds in cell lines. And then at the same time, we establish a PDX from the patient, but 50% of them will actually take. And then we can now we can test the drugs in the PDX and determine whether they're appropriate for the patient. So I'll stop here um, and just thank a lot of people, as you know, I have both a uh, computational and experimental lab, and I think these are analyses that are only possible thanks to the completely integrative work of these two components, but also to the work of a lot of collaborators. I've named many of them from uh, Dolfo Ferrando to, uh, uh, to Antonio Yavarone and uh, Ricardo de la Faber during the talk, uh, but in particular, I wanted to remind all, all the people that have worked, the humongous group of people that have worked on the International Net Consortium, um, including people here in the audience. Thank you.